This is it, people. This is what you've been waiting for. This is Everyday Celebrity Podcast. The podcast for everyday people with everyday problems trying to find everyday solutions to accomplish everyday goals. Let's start the show. And now a word from our sponsor. If you think you might be feeling depressed, stressed, anxious, or overwhelmed, today's sponsor, BetterHelp, is here for you. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help you. Talk to your therapist in a private, online environment at your convenience. There is a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's 20,000-plus therapist network that gives you access to help that you may not be available in your area. You just fill out the questionnaire to help access your specific needs, and then you can get matched with the therapist in as little as 48 hours. Then you schedule a video or phone session, plus you can exchange unlimited messages and everything you share is completely confidential. You can request a new therapist at no additional charge anytime. Join the 3 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist. Get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp.com slash Everyday Celebrity. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash everyday celebrity it's waiting for you 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 welcome to another episode of everyday celebrity podcast and i want podcast in oakland i want podcast in the bay area and today since we're kicking off breast cancer awareness i think it's month um i have a special guest she is a breast cancer survivor here to tell her story and she is also many other things <laughs> <laughs> that we're going to dabble into uh so shana welcome to the show thank you how was your night it's been chilling good yeah how about you <laughs> it was good so uh before we get into like the the nitty-gritty um oh, it, it feels weird me interviewing you because we known each other for i guess a couple of years now yeah. but you went through a experience that a lot of women don't go through and a lot of women should know about um but before we get into that uh let's start on your origins oh yes are you originally from the bay area i am not originally from the bay i grew up in colorado mm-hmm. but i've been in San Francisco, I lived there for a few years, starting in 2011, and then I've been in Oakland since 2013. When did you leave Colorado? Oh, 2010. In 2010? <laughs> Thanks for correcting me. <laughs> yeah, 2010. And for, for what reasons? Um, you know, I was 25 at the time, hadn't lived anywhere else, mm. grew up in a beautiful place where the mountains were my backyard and what I thought was normal for all children to grow up. What with. place is that? Boulder, Colorado. Oh, Boulder, okay. Yeah. And I just felt like something wasn't aligned entirely for me in Colorado. Mm. And I took the chance and I moved away. So were you already you um you see you say you were twenty five, so you already like finished college and all this stuff? Yeah, I graduated and was working and do, working with musicians, doing band management. What did you graduate in? Communications and political science. Okay. What school? <laughs> the University of Colorado at Boulder. Is that different from like the actual just University of Colorado? 
No, it's the same thing. It's the same thing? Yeah. That's like the D1 school that has all the sports teams and all that? Yeah. That's on TV? The Buffs. Okay. Yeah. And how was college life for you? Um, It was interesting. I <clears throat> only went for three years to the university. Mm-hmm. And the first year was like a lot of shenanigans and partying with kids who were getting their tuition paid for by their parents. And I was working full time as well as going to school. And I just realized one day that like I couldn't party. Like I was there for a reason. So I, my last two years, I just like really buckled down and moved back home, lived at home, saved money and studied. You say you were working during college. What were you doing? Oh, I had a few jobs. I worked at Blockbuster for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah, I know. (laughs) It was great. Shows your age. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Yeah, no, I loved Blockbuster. We got I fucking loved Blockbuster too. It was the shit. (laughs) Like going into a Blockbuster and your kids will be excited as fuck like to yeah. see all those movies back in the day yeah exactly it was and yeah. like you know i remember like dvds were like the thing when i was starting to work there and oh, I, I was i was back when the v when there was like vhs you get used to yeah. get charged when you don't rewind the oh movies. yeah so i hated calling people to tell them that they are their films were late or that they had a fee or something so Mm. i used to make accents when i would call (laughs) just to like make it a little bit more silly but at the end of it the reason why i quit was because some guy threw a dvd at me like case because he had a fee and i couldn't override it which i Mm. always did but i like could not override his fee Mm. and he threw it at me and i was like you know what I don't want to work for a corporation anymore. Fuck this shit. And I quit. And I have never worked for a corporation ever since. Yeah, I think there's still like one blockbuster in the whole country yeah. that's still open right now. Yeah. I don't know where it is though, but, but anyway, so you were working for Blockbuster. Um, and I worked at a cafe and I worked at the Boulder Theater. Mm-hmm. That was my last job um, when I was in college. And then I started working for a band manager. So why did, why did you think that you didn't fit in what made you realize that you like this isn't the place for me well leaving helped me find that answer and i think a big part of me is leaving as what you visited somewhere no i lived in israel for a little bit Mm. and then came straight here from that experience i've lived in india as well and just having Living in a place like the Bay where you're exposed to every single type of person is, I think, a necessary way of existence for me. Like, I don't want to live in a world that feels comfortable and familiar all the time. Mm -hmm. I want to have experiences where I'm learning something new and getting an entirely different perspective from somebody who I would never have met Mm -hmm. in Colorado. Like, we never would have met in Colorado. It just, Why is that? Because there's like number white people there? It is so segregated. Like the black community is in a specific part of Denver. Mm. The Latino communities are in specific parts of outside of Denver and Longmont. I mean, I was a little bit more exposed to that population growing up, but like it was like the Latino kids and the white kids at my school. And then mm. if you were like mixed or anything in between, like you were either alone or you assimilated into the white. Did kid you hang? Group. Who did you hang out with? I was trying to be friends with everybody. Like honestly, that mm. was my mo my entire life. Like I remember a Japanese girl came to elementary school with us, and everybody was making fun of her, and I took her under my wing mm. and just was like, "No, she like this is just another kid," and that's always been my mentality. So I really, truly was like. A friend of everybody were your parents like free spirits not like, exactly uh, like no. low-key rednecks and shit no <laughs> not either <laughs> maybe now i would say my mom might be a little low-key redneck uh. sorry mom but it's kind of true um no growing up my parents were kind of just like hippies but also were indoctrinated into a Christian cult for a little bit. And then, what? yeah. <laughs> a cult. Yeah. 
like an actual cult <laughs> well i call it a cult mm. but some people would just say it's like fundamental christian mm. but the thing is, is i'm actually jewish and so one of the reasons why they were a part of that church was because they believe that the if jews go to israel then the messiah is gonna come so, so they wanted to like you know get our family to believe that so too. your mom was jewish yeah but not your dad no okay so you were raised like very religious no no i was raised with like a little bit of that christian church experience and fortunately we stopped going when i was like seven uh-huh. and then no religion in my house and we did like christmas and hanukkah and you know passover more yeah. jewish identity honestly than anything and then that's what i was attracted to myself in my 20s are you close with your parents yeah i am they still together no fuck no thank god <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? they are happy with other people now uh. um you know they got together when they were really young and in need of one another mm. and i don't think it was necessarily if they yeah if they were in stronger places independently they i don't think that they would do they what was there any domestic violence when you were growing up yeah that you witnessed? definitely like physical yeah okay for sure mm. yeah and how did that how did that make you feel well, I didn't experience it directly, but my sister did. Mm. And so she definitely protected, I think, me. I'm the youngest of three. Mm-hmm. But even still, like, there were just things about our family where, like, yelling sometimes was more common than not. Yeah. And... But there also was a lot of laughter in my family, which is, I think, a testament to who I am now as well. Like, I really lean into finding the funny as much as I can. Do you think that was like a defense mechanism? Oh, for sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was a survivor skill. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, I had... Uh, for all there, of us. Yeah, there was domestic know? violence in uh, my family as well um, with my dad. And um, my defense mechanism was basketball. I used to fucking mm-hmm. go out and play basketball instead of. You like, still do. That's how we met. Yeah, you were playing instead, basketball at the gym. <laughs> instead of instead of hearing uh, all the shit that was going on in the house, I used to just grab my ball and go outside and play basketball. So. Yeah, yeah. Mine was also dance mm-hmm. as well, which is still is one hundred percent. Like dancing has been a massive part of my healing over the last six months. Do you feel like you were sheltered growing up? An attempt to be sheltered, yes. Like, I wasn't supposed to watch MTV, but you better fucking bet I was watching MTV. Like, mm. I needed to see those dance videos. Like, mm. that was, like, in the time when the music video was this incredible piece of art. Yeah. And, like, Missy Elliott's music videos, you would learn that choreo in classes. Like, it was so influential, and so I would sneak that in whenever I could. I did get mm. caught a couple of times, but I think eventually their relationship was dissolving so much and their their individual identities were starting to need to be attended to mm-hmm. that you know they kind of i was the last kid like i was fine so <laughs> i was yeah. left alone a lot so when my parents got divorced i didn't give i mean well i was young as shit so i didn't really understand what was going on but uh, when they got divorced i really didn't give two shits about them getting divorced mm-hmm because of the domestic violence and i was like yo my mom shouldn't be with this guy so i'm glad they're divorced and then you have other kids who are like they're heartbroken they they get go through depression and all that shit so when your parents got divorced were you young or old i was 11 and did it affect you yes and also my older sister was a new mom and a teen mom at that. So that was also kind of in our household at the time. So it was a little more complicated than their divorce being the center. Like under 18 mom? She got pregnant when she was 18 and had her at 19. Yeah. Mm. So those things happen. You guys are really rebellious, huh? Rebellious. I mean, (laughs) 
you know, I learned my lessons, but yeah. yeah. I mean, there was, you know, when instability is what you're in, mm. you try to make sense of the world in the ways you can. So, mm. but I mean, that's the best, like my eldest niece is the best thing that's ever happened <clears throat> to our family. Like she's a major gift to the yeah. world as well. But yeah, I think, what did you ask me? Did, did, a, did the divorce oh, did affect make you? How, yeah, how, well, how course. did it affect yeah, yeah. you? Well, oh yeah, totally fucked up my life. Like I think I would have been a completely <clears throat> different person if they had stayed together, mm. better or worse. I don't know. But like I would have been a totally different human being. Um, were you glad they separated or were you in like, oh, my family's breaking apart? Yeah, in retrospect, I think I, yeah, like I was, I am happy that they mm-hmm. aren't together, but because that was so, like it, the stability was still shaky from the beginning and then that destabilized the family unit entirely. Like mm-hmm. my sister was gone living with her ex-husband and raising a baby my brother was around, but kind of not really. And then as soon as he got the chance to, he left. Mm-hmm. So, and then it was just me and my mom stuck together and we did not get along for a really long time. And So I, when they divorced, you let, you went with your mom? Your mom got Yeah, my dad disappeared for a while. Okay. okay. Yeah. And why didn't you guys get along? Just being rebellious? I mean, maybe an element of that, but I think also like... I was everybody's kid. Like I wasn't like the, like a daddy's girl or a mommy's little girl. Like I was everybody's kid Mm. and like my siblings too. Like they took care of me. So I think it's like, I didn't have an identity, I guess, but almost at that time, like Mm. I think I totally just re was relearning who I was. And yeah. And then I like started hanging out with people who like, we were drinking and we were super young. We were like 12, 13 doing drugs. Damn. I mean, yeah. Like I did LSD before I ever smoked pot. And like, I just kind of allowed myself to go into that route, which was like in tandem. I was also dancing competitively and performing a lot. And that was mm. really expensive for my mom. So mm. we would be fighting a lot because I would need money to do the dance stuff and then were you hanging out with grown people when you were doing these drugs Mm -hmm. sure was yeah many times i got in cars with like i was maybe you know 14 15 to 16 i would get in cars with strangers in colorado in colorado (laughs) yeah I mean, I'm laughing, but it, it, I mean, it's not, it's not funny. No, but. I mean, I'm fucking lucky I was never raped or murdered. Yeah. Like truly. And for my friends too, that I know of, I mean, none mm-hmm. of them were murdered, but I don't know if any of them were assaulted ever, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Um, do you feel like you were experiencing drugs because you were in like a, like if you take a kid that grows up in like New York or San Francisco, like they're in the, they're in the city, like they're experiencing like a kid is experiencing like shit with grown. They they know street life at a young age, yeah, and they're not really bored. They're like moving and grooving, they're working and shit. They're like they're they're being taught responsibilities at a young age. And mm-hmm. then if you take a kid from like let's say like a a small town in Utah or some shit, or in your case, Colorado. Mm-hmm they're bored there's not really nothing going on in a little small town everyone knows each other oh what are we gonna do we're we're bored oh let's do some lsd like (laughs) do you (laughs) do you feel like you experienced drugs because of your environment or just because you were just you just wanted to do it i think just because i wanted to do it because i have friends that i grew up with who never did what i did Mm -hmm. like there was one friend she and i were very tight actually there were a couple of other ones as well, but like she and I were the closest in Mm. that experience. And like, I think for me first, it was a curiosity Mm. and then like, it was also a way to cope with not having what I needed at that time. Like we didn't have a lot of food. So Mm. it was like a way to forget about that as well. And then like, 
also emotional and economic and opportunity. Like, I mean, I just didn't see a future for myself at that point. So mm. I think smoking weed a lot and drinking and doing hallucinogens every once in a while, like actually expanded my mind. Like my friend Rachel and I, who partook in drugs together, like made a deal with each other that like our drug use was to try to expand who we were. Mm. It was very thoughtful for a teenager. Did like for sure th there were nights where we just went out and took ecstasy and just danced for sure. But like a lot of the time I we would smoke a joint and go up into the mountains and like talk about existence, you know? Yeah. And I do think it worked. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I think I'm m a more self-aware person than other people because at that young of an age, I really looked at who I was. Mm. from different facets and different perspectives. Mm. Do you dabble in drugs now? Um, I'll take shrooms every once in a while, but not like a lot. And then I'm open to it, but I'm not mm. like seeking it out. Yeah. All right. So you, uh, you were doing all this shit at a young age, but obviously you went to a, a, a university, a, a good university so you were obviously a good student right i was not a good student actually in <laughs> high school <laughs> how the fuck you get accepted into <laughs> college um i mean you made good enough grades obviously. i so i actually did a year at a community college mm. and got really good grades there and transferred mm. so i mean i had to apply I mean, that is the way to go yeah i mean like in retrospect i'm like duh like that was the way to do it but yeah um it's not like here in California where you transfer. Like I actually had to still apply for the school, um, but they looked, they didn't, they took my high school grades into consideration, but they mostly looked at my community college grades and I had like a 4.0. Did you uh, apply to any other colleges like no. out of state or anything? Mm -hmm. You just wanted to stay in? Yeah, I followed my friend Rachel <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't, I was so lost. I was like really truly lost at that mm. age and i didn't have my mom was trying like don't get me wrong like yeah. she was doing her fucking best but that woman was working 80 to 100 hours a week mm. so it wasn't you know and like also dealing with the trauma of the relationship she had w it been in and everything mm -hmm. so i just didn't have the guidance that i needed at that time to make decisions that were more true to myself than the ones I did make. Like in retrospect, I would never have gone to school at that age. I would have gone, my gut was to go and travel the world. I really wanted to go to Nepal. Mm -hmm. And then, and it, there was no reason why I shouldn't have done it, but I freaked out because everybody else was going to school and I wasn't. So I kind of fell into what we're told is supposed to be the yeah. natural progression. Are you still friends with Rachel now? Yeah, she's still one of my besties. Is Love, Rachel. <laughs> Where is she at? She's in Boulder, married still? with okay. two kids. Yeah, she's All living right. that life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so you got into college, graduated. What year did you graduate or finish? 2007. 2007? Yeah. What made you study what you studied? Um, I went initially thinking I was going to do international relations. And I had a professor that just turned me off. He essentially was like, you can't change the world. Mm. So I was like, oh. He was right. So. Yep, I know. <laughs> but <laughs> so it's still not a great thing to say to younger people, though. Yeah. I, I do think that the youth have the power to tra transform. So well, I, re I respect when a teacher tells a motherfucker the real yeah, I guess that, but the way that it was done was like, and you shouldn't even try kind of thing where I don't think that that's how it should be presented. I think it should be like, it's it's hard, it's difficult, but there's always like, you're laying a foundation for somebody else. Though. I mean, I would say you can't change the world, but you can change a person. Yeah, exactly. And then that person can change another person yeah, exactly. and then so on and so on. Yeah, precisely. Mm. So by that point, I was like needing to graduate still on time because I didn't have the money to pay for school for longer than what I went for. Mm. And I already had enough credits for poli-sci to be my minor. 
And then communication was just like a natural, easy step for me because that's actually what I do for mm-hmm. a living. So yeah, yeah it, it worked out well. So you traveled to, where'd you say you went to after college? Um, well, after college, I stayed in Colorado for a little bit. Um, I mean, I did like trips around, but then when I was 25, I moved to Israel. And what sparked that? So I did what's called birthright or tagli in Hebrew. And it is a free 10 day trip to Israel for people who identify as Jewish. Okay. And oh, so you can go learn your like history and shit? That and also like it is a bit of a propaganda move to get people to to get Jewish people to either move to Israel or, you know, support it for all of time. And that's like a you know Do you have to prove you're Jewish? Um, I don't recall, but I do know some people who were like, Yeah, my great great grandma was Jewish and I was so still able to go on the trip. Basically what I'm saying is <laughs> Can I be like, oh, I want to go because I'm Jewish and they, I can get a free trip? I think so, yeah. Uh, I mean, now, no, you're too old for it, but <laughs> if you had done it 10 years ago, probably. Oh, yeah. Okay. So anyways, I went on that and it was like a pretty transformational experience for me. Mm. Um, and it was kind of like a first time where I actually felt a little, like a sense of belonging and you know like people knew my name like mm-hmm. saying shoshana would inspire all these people to sing the song that has my name in it and i don't know it just like felt like a home feeling and i wanted to explore that more so when you when you went there you were you said you were lost and then when you went there you found a sense of community and then when you left and came back to Colorado, you wanted to keep that feeling. So yeah. You, and and I, you feel like you couldn't get that in Colorado. So that's why no. you left. I mean, I could. Okay. This is the thing. I can always get community because mm-hmm. I'm really, that's like my purpose in life is to have a place where I feel like I belong and where other people feel like they belong. Yeah. That's like who I am to the core. So I for sure have really good friends and connections in Colorado. Mm-hmm. But for me and my wholeness, it wasn't enough. There just wasn't enough for me to explore there. Mm. So yeah, it was more that, like wanting to understand the world better. Um, but you know, I also grew up like Rachel and I were the only Jewish girls in our friend group and it kind of wasn't talked about even still to this day. I feel like a little awkward with some of my girlfriends that I've known since we were in fifth grade Mm. that like I'm Jewish and like have Jewish customs in my life. I mean, is that a big deal or something? I mean, it, yeah, I grew up with like people saying pretty anti Jewish things. So yeah, Mm. it was not, it was a very Anglo Saxon Christian white, wealthy community that I was in. I was totally an outsider. I had a single mom and we were not rich. Yeah. And we were Jewish. Like it was just like (laughs) this totally different character than everybody else. How long did you stay in, uh, what was it again? Boulder? No, no, no. Uh, What? Israel? Israel, yeah. (laughs) How long did you stay in Israel? Um, a year. Damn. Uh-huh. It was only supposed to be 10 days? No, no, no. That was years later. Oh. Yeah. Like, I went on the 10-day trip, and the seed was planted, mm-hmm. but I stayed in Colorado a little bit longer, but I started learning Hebrew and just, like, finding myself, actually, with Israelis a lot more. Like, it was like a magnet was happening. And then I was working with a band manager, And I learned about an opportunity to work for another band manager in Tel Aviv. And I did it and I made it happen. So when you were in Israel for a year, Mm -hmm. did you experience any, uh, I don't know, did you like the way women are treated, like women's rights and shit? Yeah. I mean, it's like depends on the community that you're in. So Mm -hmm. like the super religious they're called Haridi or Hasidic. Mm-hmm. Um, no, don't fucking like what they do, but that's like any fundamental religion. I'm not into 
the oppression of women, but like, I mean, we're living in that right now. We're literally living in a Christian society that's forcing their values on women right did now. Did you, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, did you, conf, uh, com, did you bow down and go to their like rules? No, or were you no, just no. Like, it's oh, very, I want to wear a mini skirt. I'm going to wear it. Yeah, no. Tel Aviv is like the sexiest city in the world. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Very hot. Lots of. I might be confused because I'm thinking of like some Muslim uh, type shit. Where people are no, I mean there, that exists too. Able to drive and all that shit. Is no, that how Israel it is, is not like that at all. <laughs> okay. No, but like then you have, but you have your populations uh-huh. that are insular that have that. So there are Palestinians mm-hmm. or Arab Israelis who maybe do have those type of religious decisions mm-hmm. choices that they're making. But like Israel, especially Tel Aviv as a whole, is like. Very it's like modern. Very modern. Okay. It's more modern than Oakland. Like mm. their streets are clean. Nobody's living on the streets. Mm. Like they have nice okay, maybe that's untrue. There are people living on the streets there. But like it is a very modern city, mm. massively. Progr- so you, like, you felt safe the whole time. Yeah. hmm Definitely. For sure. Okay. And then when you came back, well, why did you why did you come back? Why don't you just um stay I forever? was wanting to and then my dad got sick and so i wanted to be closer Mm. so i I missed my family honestly Mm. that was like a really big part of it was a desire to be close to everybody and when he had his health scare it just i went i came back home and then was in colorado for a little bit and then decided it wasn't the right place for me you didn't fall in love in tel aviv like Oh, I did. Almost got married. Every single week. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I had r- beautiful romances there mm. and stuff for sure, but marriage was not and may never be important to me. Mm. Okay, so you so you come back and then boom. What? So why San Francisco of all places? Did you visit San Francisco before you moved? Yeah. Out? So my mom's eldest sister lived out here. She lived on Lombard. Mm-hmm. And when I was a little kid, oh, we used rich, to though. come. Yeah, she was a part of the. Well, she is Jewish, you know. Hey, watch yourself. <laughs> um, she was a part of like a one of the first search engine companies like when what do you mean like, like google it wasn't google i don't think she doesn't really talk about it very uh-huh. clearly but it was like i remember it being like search engines like maybe ask jeeves potentially ask jeeves i mean but it was like the software behind that. it. that's yeah. the thing is like they they are the ones who figured out how to make yeah it actually a thing Okay. So yeah, I remember I visiting her, her and like really being enchanted with this place. And enchanted by like the openness and all that shit. And the hills and like people ride around in bikes naked. I don't remember that as a little kid, but maybe I saw that like when I was a teenager out here and I was like totally into it. <laughs> like I'm here for it. And like going to City Lights bookstore with mm. my dad. I remember that like very clearly growing up. Mm-hmm. We would go to that bookstore. So from so. the first time you visited and then when you went back to Colorado, how quick was the move? Decades almost. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I first came out here when I was five. Oh, okay. And I didn't well, move well, out here until I was 25. <laughs> so when you came, well, yeah, let me rephrase that. When you came back from uh, Tel Aviv, how fast was the move from Colorado to um, San Francisco? Maybe two and a half months. That's fast. Yeah. Okay. And then when you moved here, where did you? Where in San Francisco did you live? I was in the mission. Well, at first I was house hopping for like a month and a half, two months. Did you have any friends out here? Yeah, that mm-hmm. was also like a big reason. Was my homeboy Joshua, who's mm-hmm. from here. He when we first met on the birthright trip going mm-hmm. to Israel. He, the one of the first things he said to me was like, you belong in the Bay. And I was yeah. like, what? Really? <laughs> so that seed got planted by him. And yeah, he let me live in his room in a house 
rent free for like three weeks. And then finally he was like, you got to find a place to live and get out of here. Because mm. <laughs> he was staying at his girlfriend's. And then I got really lucky and um, had to dog sit for my dearest friend, Day Schildkrit, who is a internationally known artist mm-hmm. under the name of Morning Alters. And he needed a dog sitter and I ended up living at their apartment after that. They so could, you went there to go watch the dog and just ended up staying? Yeah, they had a three bedroom on 24th and Cap. And mm-hmm. um, they had somebody who was living there and they didn't want her to live there anymore. And I fit in better. So mm-hmm. I moved in and lived there for about three years. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it was great. I loved, loved living in the mission. It was amazing. Mm. How long were you in the mission for? Three years. Three years, and you came to Oakland? Hmm? Then you came to Oakland? Then I lived in India for six months, and then I came to Oakland. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Why'd you go back to India? Or why did you why did you go to India? Um partly people like a friend, partly a man that I was in love with, and then partly because I was twenty eight and why the fuck not like do it? And I didn't love my job. Mm. So I just said yes. I feel like you you meet men (laughs) (laughs) you you meet these men from other countries you fall in love and then you and then you go to them to to stay i think it happened multiple times Uh, i mean it's happened for sure but this particular guy is actually from san jose what happened what happened with you and because you frequently went to colombia correct cuba cuba okay uh-huh. you fell in love with a man in cuba I, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you knew that and then you were like going back and forth and you were weren't you going to move there or some shit or bring um, him here it was more so an attempt to try to bring him here yeah what happened with that the tell pandemic the, tell the people the pandemic happened fucked it up and then I got diagnosed like right after that. So fucked it up in what way? Like, what do you mean the pandemic? Logistically, I mean, I was literally supposed to go there April 2020, mm-hmm. and the day that I was supposed to have flown back was the last day that they let any flights leave the island. Okay. So I'm really glad that I didn't go. Um, but yeah, like I just couldn't go there. Like logistically, we were. I all mean, but if stuck. you if you guys were to the point where I'm bringing you here. I wasn't there yet. It was on the table, but it wasn't, I wasn't fully ready. Like that was like going to see him again was kind of one more step in that direction. So you couldn't go see him and then what you guys just like cut it off? Um, well, did you find out some shit that he was? Yeah. I mean, he started, we were, he started living his life there. I mean, it was just hard. Like it was scary for many, many months. And Mm. then, Living his life how? Like he, I mean, he was messing with another girl? Later on, but yeah, we weren't committed. It wasn't like... Oh, I mean, of course. Even if you were committed, you got to expect he's in a whole nother fucking... Yeah, but like that's... I would never expect somebody to be committed from that far of a distance. Okay. I wouldn't expect myself to be committed from that far of a distance. Mm-hmm. Like, fuck that. I'm not going to limit myself. But I think, yeah, just like all of these things started happening that were out of our control and mm-hmm. it just... I didn't, I don't want that anymore. That essentially is what happened. Like Mm. I don't want, I still care about him and we say hello every once in a while, but like, it's not my person. It's not like where I want my energy to go. So in order to bring him here, I mean, I'm assuming you guys were talking about marriage, right? It would have had to have been that way. Yeah. So you were ready to get married to him? No, I was not ready to get married to him, but I was open to it. So you were ready then? I mean, if you were open to it. I'm open to it, I think, with anybody who feels like they could be a good partner. So you thought he was a good partner to get married to? Yeah, he would have been a good husband for sure. So if that's the case, why did you, why aren't you guys talking now? 
pandemic is over. It's not. Well, I mean, it's technically not, but <laughs> we're living with it now in a different way. Yes. Um, well, Joe Biden just said like a shit as well. who I want anymore. Like, that's just not, that's not who I want. Mm. And I don't want to, I've already had enough, like, challenges in finding relationships. Like, why mm. make it harder by having it be a person that literally lives in one of the most difficult countries to get out of? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> that's just not what I want to do with my energy. Why do you search out people from other countries? I don't search them out. I am not do on like a mission <laughs> to make this happen. It's just Aren't most happen. of your relationships with people overseas? No. No. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No. Mm-mm. Okay. Well, you said you have trouble. What did you say? You have trouble finding love. Why is that? I don't know. Right. I well, also you know. wonder that too. <laughs> you know. Uh, I hate it when girls say, oh, I have, they know what the <laughs> fuck is I'm going on. I think I'm choosing the wrong people. And who's the wrong people? Um, no, I mean, I don't want to name names. I mean, you don't got to <laughs> name names, but just describe <laughs> describe the people that you're choosing. What are they, like um, drug dealers, thugs? What, what's going on? Probably at some point. But, you know, like people who are a reflection of where I have been emotionally as well. Like if I'm available to them or not. Mm. And so I think I attract and am attracted to men specifically who are kind of like me in a sense of like always wondering if there's something else Mm. and like not wanting to totally commit. But I'm changing. I want that now. I want a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I like, haven't had one for so long. So I'm just curious what it would be like to actually have a boyfriend. So if any of you listeners want to go on a date, uh, you just let me know. <laughs> so in order to, I mean, you say you attract a certain person, right? So in order to attract something different, then obviously, yes, obviously, you need to change. Mm-hmm. You need to look in the mirror and be like, why am I attracting all these toxic men? Yeah. I mean, I'm and, looking at it for sure. And you started to change, you said? I am. I have changed. Actually, you have changed. I would say. What changed about you? Well, getting cancer was definitely a mark of a very big shift in mm-hmm. my life, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like going through that experience without a partner was sad. Like I, there were moments where I really wish I had had that type of companionship. And when did you find out you were diagnosed and what type of cancer did you have? Yeah. So I was actually diagnosed October 23rd, 2022. So in breast cancer awareness month, Mm -hmm. which was a trip to experience because when I felt the lump, I immediately knew that it was cancer. And so I, wait, then, so wait, so you felt that you didn't yeah. go get checked? I did. So well, you, after I felt it, yeah. Okay. What made you like? Oh, it was just breast cancer awareness, and you just felt no. Like, I noticed it in September. So, um, for for me, luckily, it was high enough in my chest mm. that I was able to see it. But there are a lot of people who were diagnosed under 45, which is usually when breast cancer becomes a higher risk for women. Actually, you know, all, a lot of people, but mostly for women. You said under 45? And over, four, over 45 40. plus is when it's a higher risk, but mm-hmm. under 45 is what I'm in and it's unusual to mm-hmm. have it. But that being said, it actually is becoming more common. Mm-hmm. Um. I believe the stat right now is one in eight people will have breast cancer in their lifetime. But there's a chance that that could actually be shifted because I think a lot more people are getting diagnosed at younger ages. Mm -hmm. So for some folks, like the lump could be in a portion of their breast that they don't touch often. And Mm -hmm. that's like why it's so important for people to understand breast health 
and what your body is telling you. Like I was very much listening to what my body was saying. Well, explain the, like the feeling of the lump. Like, I mean, cause I don't have breasts and a woman might touch her breasts and then feel like a, uh, like a lump, but they might just think, Oh, it's nothing. So uh, what, no how does, how what, does a lump yeah. feel? I mean, like, it's hard. It's like a very hard, I mean, this is what mine felt like. I don't know what everybody is feels mm. like. So I can only speak from what I, I experienced. Mm. Um, it feels like a very hard ball and like, like hard, not gushy super hard okay but i don't know if there could be some that are gushy i don't know yeah like i'm not an expert so um yeah but it's also like noticing if your breast has changed shape so for example i had it on my right upper right chest and Mm. my right breast started to swell and kind of like tip down like in a different direction Mm. and so your body is reacting to what's happening inside of you Mm mm-hmm um, so it's really important. Like my oncologist, I asked her, like, should I be checking my boobs every month? There's like a a trend to do Monday like mammogram for yourself on the first of the Monday of the month. And I asked her if I should be doing that, and she said you can. But also, what you really need to understand is your body, and like understand the changes that are happening in it and be very vigilant when something feels wrong, which is what I did do. Like as soon as I felt the lump, I knew mm-hmm. it. I needed to take action. So, so when you felt the lump, you automat you immediately knew that it was cancer. My intuition did. And the deeper me knew it. Mm. Yeah. Do you, anyone in your family have breast cancer? My grandmother and my aunt, the one who worked for the search engine <laughs> company. And they both um, survived they both it? They survived. My aunt actually had it twice, and she survived mm. it both times. So you find out you have breast cancer, and what, uh, I mean, mentally, how did that make you feel? Um, well, so it was super interesting timing because, you know, it was during the pandemic before vaccinations were happening. And people were still living at home, isolated. And I just was like, went into a bit of a logistical mindset because Mm. I needed to figure out how I was going to like do the treatment. Um, But no, I mean, I was devastated. Like it was and still is like the hardest moment of my life. And I found out the day before we did the Oakland comedy festival, which is, um, it was all virtual. Thank God. But I was at home Mm. watching on my computer, crying and laughing and then crying and laughing. Mm. Um, and I'm so lucky though, that I had that festival because it just, it did distract me a bit. Yeah. Did you get into, were you depressed? at any point of time because you didn't have you said you didn't have a boyfriend at this time but i'm assuming you i mean you obviously have friends and shit but did you have someone that you can like talk to and be like oh like i'm going through this and all this other shit you yeah. said you went through it alone so i'm i'm assuming well I, like, d- I didn't go through it alone that's like the one silver lining for mm-hmm. sure but like i did go through it alone like there's those two things that were existing at the same time i was extremely held by my community and my family mm. but i was also very alone like so they were existing at the same time um yeah community but you didn't have that one person to go home to and, and like cry on the shoulder or make you feel good yeah Okay. I didn't. Mm-hmm. Which maybe also in retrospect is good because in the support group that I'm in, which is called Bay Area Young Survivors, it's for people who are diagnosed 45 and under. Mm-hmm. I've actually noticed a lot of people have broken up with their partners that they were with when they went through treatment. So I think like maybe it's a the grass is greener type of thing. Yeah. Um. But no, I mean, my sister was my chemo supporter um she came with me to my chemo sessions to help me with cold capping which helped preserve some of my hair but not all of it and then she stayed with me for three days did you have to cut your hair 
Um, not until after I was done with chemo because the cold capping is dry ice caps that you put on throughout the entire day of chemo mm. for eight hours. They're very heavy and you're, I was super fucked up on drugs because mm. I had, you had to take steroids and then I had to take an anti-nausea medicine that would make me tired. So I would have like this duality of the steroids hitting me and then the like anti-nausea medicine hitting me. Yeah. But, and then this cap was going on my head every, I think it was like we had to change it every 20 minutes or something. And my sister was doing it, like changing out the caps from this box that had dry ice in it. And I was just fucked up, like getting medicine pushed into my body. And then we would go home and she would have to do the cap for, I think, four more hours. And then I like couldn't water or wash my hair with warm water. I couldn't put it under the shower head directly. I had to use like a bucket of mm -hmm. cold water. It was awful. Like in retrospect, I don't know if I had to make that choice again. I don't know if I would do cold capping, but also my hair has grown back thicker and stronger mm. than it was before, which is not likely when you don't do cold capping. So explain, I mean, everyone hears this word chemo, chemo. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll be honest, I don't literally know exactly what the process of chemo is. So can you tell people or as much knowledge as you know, like what exactly is chemo and the process <laughs> of fucking chemo therapy? Yeah, like, I mean, what exactly I only are they know doing? mine because the the, yeah. the breadth of chemotherapy is vast and mm. there's even like pills, I guess, that are chemotherapy. Yeah, just so, speak on what you know. Yeah, so what I know for the type of breast cancer I had, so that's the other thing. There's various types of breast cancer and there are all hormonal which mm -hmm. I wish I had known that at a younger age because I do think that if I had had more attention to balancing my hormones, that there's a chance that this wouldn't have happened so young. So you were, and then there's receptors. So those are three factors mm -hmm. that are happening. Um, and the combination of what the hormones are and if you have a receptor negative or positive determines what type of treatment you're going to get. So I had estrogen positive, proestrogen negative, and HER2 positive. HER2 is a receptor that 20, 30 years ago, if you had, was a death sentence because they didn't know how to treat it. So my chemotherapy was, oh my God, let's see if I can remember, TCHP. I don't think I've removed the otaxol, oh, carboplatin, herceptin, Pertuzumab. Those were the medicines that I was on. Mm. And I chose... You know, are these like pills or what? No, this is... They're infusions. They're liquid okay. infusions. Okay. So I chose to get what's called a port. And it's a device that's placed in your body, depending on what type of cancer you have. Some are up in your chest. Some can be in your belly. That's and they're like, shooting this like into your veins? And then your they bloodstream. put an IV oh. into your port. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into your bloodstream. Okay. Yeah. So that's chemo. That's chemo. But then like the other interesting thing about chemo that I actually forget a lot is like the medicine that you have to take around it. Like I would have to take steroids for mm -hmm. three days. I would have to take Claritin the day of. I would have to take all a lot of anti-nausea medicine. Um, I'm sure there were other things I'm forgetting. Like my nightstand had so much medicine on it for those six months mm. um yeah so i had six rounds three weeks apart why when you have chemo why do you need why do you need to cut your hair off well so it depends on the type of chemo you're getting but pretty much all breast cancer treatment if you're getting chemo mm. um you will have hair loss. So I lost my eyelashes, my eyebrows, my punani hair, which was great. 
my leg <laughs> hair, everything, you know, like all of your all coochie of your hair, hair falls coochie, off. Yeah. Your whole, you have alopecia. Wow. It's medically induced alopecia. So people just cut their hair just because it'll fuck or just fall off. So I might as well just cut it yeah, off. Yeah. And it just helps like, I mean, with it not looking so thin, but like, that's what happens when you do when mm. I did the cold capping, like I had very thin stringy hair. Mm. Um, so yeah, it just is better. And it's also, it's really traumatizing to have your hair fall out. And I experienced oh, yeah, yeah. that. Like, so if you are going through treatment and you don't trim your hair, that's actually why they recommend you do it. Mm. Because having your hair fall into your hand is very traumatic. Yeah, especially if you're a woman where hair is like. I think everybody feels that way. Like, I think hair is. Well, such, guys, not like, so much. I mean, guys. I don't, don't know. know. You're not bald. Hair. That's why you don't know. Like, I mean, my hair falls out all the time. I have dreads. Yeah, but that's different, though. Like, it's not like massive chunk. Yeah. I think for anybody, if you had that happen, mm-hmm. a massive chunk would totally be devastating. Mm-hmm. So you. We're doing chemo, and I mean, you had a lump in your breast, so I'm assuming you had to have surgery, correct? I did. Yeah, but that was after chemo, a month afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I had what's called the lumpectomy. So there's mastectomy and lumpectomy. And I was super fucking lucky to be cancer free. They had, there was no residual cancer. I actually noticed the lump had gone down. Um, pretty like um, after my first chemo infusion. Mm-hmm. So I think that I had gotten rid of the ca- the cancer cells mm-hmm. pretty early on. Um, but because this disease is so unpredictable and they still don't understand it entirely. Yeah. Following a doctor's order to poison myself essentially was really hard to accept because I had a feeling that it was gone, but she had the expertise to tell me to not fuck around. And what do you mean? Poison my yourself? treatment. I mean, chemo is poison essentially. Uh, okay. But it saved my life. You know. I mean, so you had chemo, which your your hair was falling off. You had a mm-hmm. surgery on your breast. Yeah, but where- chemo wasn't just my hair falling off. I was very sick, like very, very sick. Well, this question is based on like your physical appearance. So mm-hmm. you, you, your hair was falling off. You had surgery on your breast where I'm assuming left scars and they had to cut into your breast to take the lump off, right? Yeah. So did you... Was there any point of time where you felt like my body is changing? I am not sexy anymore. Oh, yeah. 100%. (laughs) Ew, yeah. I mean, this is the other thing about cancer treatment. Your sex drive disappears. Mm. And for women or people with vaginas, (laughs) it will make you dry up. Mm. Like you don't have lubrication naturally. Mm. And you know, like you also can't be exposed to people. Like you have no immune system when you're in chemotherapy. So you can't have sex or anything? You can, but like we also were living in a pandemic. And so it was a risk Mm -hmm. like that a lot of people don't want to take, but you also don't want it. Like I forced myself to masturbate Mm. during that time. Because I just wanted to have a fucking sense of pleasure. Mm. And it wasn't like, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't awesome. Like now, you know, and like where I am now in my body, sex is a totally different experience for me. Like I really know what it feels like. How rude. (laughs) And you're not going to edit this out. (laughs) No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, but yeah, like I really had a sense of what it feels like to not 
want to have sex to not feel desired. Like, especially when I lost my eyebrows and my eyelashes, Mm -hmm. like those are two natural features that I've always been proud of and happy about. And like having those go away was really just sad. But I do remember, like, I think I was maybe, I was still in chemo. I had to have been, and I was walking my dog and this very cute guy hit on me. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked because at that time, like, I also was lucky. I, I gained weight during chemo, which is, helps your body withstand the medicine. But I, like, didn't feel good. Like, I felt weak. I felt like, like a lump. You say gain weight. Did you, you know, are you saying you got a little ass? I've always had a little ass. Well, did you get more ass? But I got a lot more ass. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Let's be specific here. <laughs> <laughs> and belly and legs. Like, it was, you mm. know, the whole kit and caboodle. But, you know, it wasn't like, I don't know. It was the biggest I had ever been in my life, for okay. sure. But yeah, I remember him hitting on me and I just kept saying, are you fucking with me right now? And he was like, no, why do you think that? And I, it was because I was so disconnected from my sense of my beauty. Mm. It, it was gone at that time. So you you started to get into um, like dancing and shit. I see your, your post Instagram videos of you dancing very sensual sexy dancing (laughs) is that a way of like getting your confidence back yeah so well i grew up dancing that was always a big part of my life but were you doing that type of dance no because this type of dancing which is called heels is a relatively new style of dance that Mm. has become quite popular and it's one of the most empowering forms of dance that I've ever been in. So when I grew up, like I was in a competitive dance company and I remember when I got boobs and the other girls didn't, they used to tape my boobs down, Mm -hmm. which, you know, now after almost losing them is like how much shame I had around my chest growing up and how much I love it now and how every single day I look at my breasts and I'm so thankful I still have them on me. Oh my God, he's texting while I'm talking about cancer, you Um, guys. (laughs) What the fuck? I'm listening, okay. (laughs) And yeah, so now I'm doing heels dancing. Oh my gosh, turn your phone. Just keep talking, just keep talking. It's so distracting. Turn your, mute it. Um, uh, yes, go ahead. So heels is like, a, yeah, a style that combines all forms of dance. It has ballet, jazz, hip hop, stripping, mm-hmm. all, every single type of dance style is in it. And I started taking a class totally by chance in January of 2022. So this year. Mm-hmm. And now I can't go a week without a class. Okay. Yeah. And let's talk about uh, your comedy festival. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Talk about it. What is it? What is the name of the shit? When? When did? It when was it created? Like Oakland Comedy Festival. Mm-hmm. It is happening this October fourteenth through the sixteenth. Mm-hmm. And I started it in 2019. Yes, I remember when I was bar hopping with you looking for comedians. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we. So I should be like a part owner of this shit. Well, we weren't. First off, we weren't looking for comedians. I already had booked them and I was yeah. going to introduce them uh, to excuse me. myself so <laughs> that people knew who I was. Okay. <laughs> um,. But so tell, wait, wait, so tell me, if you want to be a part owner, you have to invest first. <laughs> well, we can talk about that, but <laughs> tell me what, like, like, where did this come about? Like, why did you create yeah. this? So, I think at the time I was just really observing how 
separated people were in our social and political mindsets and how comedy was the one place. And I think that this is still, this is like at risk of being true. Like comedy was the one place where people could make jokes about these aspects of our society that we live in. Mm -hmm. And now I'm concerned about comedy being a place where we can push those boundaries Mm -hmm. and it be an art form. Like too many people are like, well, this comedian said X, Y, and Z. And it's like, that person's a fucking joke teller, not a like government official who's making laws that are actually impacting your life. I'm glad you say that. And so comedy when i the oakland comedy festival when i first started it was really just a desire to bring people together through one of my favorite things laughter Mm -hmm. and the comedy scene in oakland is so rich and beautiful and diverse and abundant and one day i just was wondering if there had ever been a festival here and Mm -hmm. from what i could find there had not so I did a tarot reading, (laughs) which I turn to often Uh, in my life. The psychic told you to start it? No, my own friend and I did a tarot reading. And the cards told me to do it. Mm. They they confirmed. It's not that they told me to do it. They confirmed what I already knew, which is what tarot is. Like Mm. it is really just your higher self reflecting back to Mm. you. So I... Yeah, we. I had like a little crew of people, mm-hmm. all volunteers, all amazing, and we made it happen. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the shows sold out the first year, and then we decided to do it in 2020. Then the pandemic happened, and then everybody in my volunteer group had something terrible happen to them or in their immediate family. Mm-hmm. So that started to just fall off. And now it's just myself and Matthew Laney, who's the booking agent. Mm-hmm. And we only see each other during the festival. And that's then <laughs> we work together from a distance for the entire year, booking talent. And this is, yeah, the fourth year. So, I mean, where 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 is this held? Is it like different venues or yeah. So sometimes we co-produce with shows that already have the show on the schedule that weekend. And mm-hmm. then a lot of other times we're book we're producing it ourselves at venues. So this year I'm really excited to have one show at my really good friends, Barber loft, Dapper Dan's Barber loft mm-hmm. uh, in uptown. And so that will be a really intimate and cool, unique venue. Mm-hmm. Um, then we're doing, we're partnering with comedy Oakland who have their shows running out of the Washington Inn in old town. Um, we have craft comedy at Federation Brewery. We're running our two shows at Original Pattern Brewing Company. And there's a few more, but honestly, I can't remember them all because we have a lot. You said this is a festival. How long does it last? It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it's a whole weekend. It's a whole weekend. Friday has like about five shows. Saturday has, I think, seven or eight shows. And Sunday has two shows. Do when if people want to go to this, can I just is just like one ticket and you can go to any show during the weekend? No, we don't do that yet, but that will be how it will be in the future. Every show has a a separate ticket, but we keep it as pretty affordable. Like Mm. you could go to all the shows and spend under $200 easily. Mm. So that's like the other thing. Like we want to make sure that these are accessible to people. Yeah. We even have some free shows or donation based shows mm-hmm. for folks who like really don't want to pay <laughs> most yeah. of the time. But um yeah, we try to keep it affordable. And our priority is to pay the comics. So they always are taken care of first and whatever we can afford to give them. And then we donate 10% to a nonprofit every year. So last year was actually my breast cancer support group. This year, we're donating to Access Reproductive Rights, a Mm California-based abortion access organization, because even though we live in a progressive state, 
it is very likely that abortion is going to be taken away from us. So we need to fight for it. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen in California. It's totally possible if this federal bill. like the bill, best governor in the world. No, but if this federal bill passes that the Republicans are pushing through and if they win the House and Senate, then it's going to fucking happen. Mm. We will live in a country where abortion is illegal. So we got to fight mm. still. California cannot be complacent in this. Yeah. And so, yeah, so we're donating 10% of all of our earnings to them. And then whatever's left over, we split with the venue or, mm. and then usually don't have any leftover. <laughs> <laughs> it's a passion project. That's the other thing. Like, this is oh, not yeah, yeah. my job. Like I do, I, this is like just my heart and soul. Like I'm not making money off of this at all. And I mean, well, where do you want to see this? Where do you want to see this going? I've already had a dream about it. I know where it is going. I mean, eventually you want to make money off it, right? Eventually, I would love for it to be a source of income. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Because especially for how much I'm working on it. But I want it to be a place where comedians are coming and their careers are really getting a boost because they're a part of the festival. Mm -hmm. I want it to be of the caliber where we have comedians who I admire and who are already, you know, very settled and famous in their career coming and performing with us. Mm. And it's going to happen. I just have to get through a few more years <laughs> and make yeah. it happen. Well, four years is a, is a long time. What was the hardest thing? What's the hardest thing about putting this event together? Um, not having a big team is quite hard. Mm. Um, it really does take a village. So that's something that I'm trying to expand on. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also honestly like choosing the talent is so hard because we often get really good applications. I mean, sometimes definitely not, but like most of the time we're getting too many good options Yeah, and it's really hard to choose. So that's actually a tough part. Mm. And they had, I mean, just keeping it all together, like mm. doing it all, it's a big deal. All right. Well, tell the people where they can buy tickets. And again, if you want to give out your social medias or whatever and where they can contact you and when the festival is. Yeah. So I'll start with the festival, Oakland Comedy Festival, happening October 14, 15, and 16. And you can get tickets at oaklandcf.com. Follow us on Instagram at Oakland Comedy Festival. And my social media is at show underscore how, S H O underscore H O W. And you can see my dancing. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> shit that you're going to see on that one. <laughs> and I post funny stuff sometimes too. Okay. But mostly sexy booty dancing. Mm. <laughs> um so yeah um once again tell get like give an advice since this is like a breast cancer episode mm -hmm. sort of um tell the women out there how important it is or if you want to give out like where they can go for like breast cancer like information how to check themselves when to check themselves or whatever you want to share about the importance of being aware of your body. Yeah. Um, I don't have any specific resource other than whoever your medical professional is. And um, the best way to prevent this is to get screened. And if you have any suspicion at all that something is not right in your body, don't wait go to your doctor and get checked out. Nice. Fuck cancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to thank, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Um, it's very brave. Thank you. <laughs> very brave of you to come on this podcast and dabble into your life. Mm -hmm. Talk about personal things, but I feel like uh, that's what, because when when women hear shit 
from a person that they can relate to instead i mean you can hear this from rihanna fucking cardi b if you want <laughs> but actually hearing it from someone in your neighborhood that you can really fucking relate to that know that you know that's like just a woman just like you just a normal woman i'm not normal well you know what the fuck <laughs> i'm talking about a normal woman that's just like the app just an everyday that, celebrity that's all that i am yes perfect yes <laughs> good wording a normal everyday celebrity in your neighborhood i think women would take it more in and take it more seriously so all you women out there check ch- your titties check your titties and if you don't want to check it when like when the man is touching your oh titties my God, I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> no. when the guy is touching your titties and he's like girl what is this listen to him yeah, this is actually true listen to him yeah because there's been many times or a woman like whoever is touching your titties whatever, like, oh, whoever there's been many times when when someone's sucking on your titties and touching your titties and they're like oh what is this lump and then you get an attitude be like the fuck you mean you? Are what you the okay? fuck you mean Are you like process what do you mean <laughs> what do you mean what is this lump get off me like listen to him okay that's all i have to say so yeah thank you uh so sean everybody go to our page go on oakland comedy fest uh the comedy festival is october 14th 15th and 16th 15th and 16th it's a great event supporting uh local bay area talent and the beyond but most and beyond yeah. but yeah but it's, it's an event in the bay area so you're yeah. basically supporting the bay area yes. and it's year number four and without the support and people buy tickets and supporting this i won't do it again we <laughs> won't have year number five so <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah all of you guys get tickets and i'm talking to y'all but i want uh, hopefully i want to i want a free ticket but we'll, we'll we go talk about that <laughs> 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 this is everyday celebrity podcast and we are out you uh-huh.